You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Vermont Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. As our good friend and uh, inspiration for this pod- podcast, George Costanza would say, worlds are colliding. We have. Dr. Greg Renoff, who not only wrote the book about Van Halen called Van Halen Rising, how a Southern California backyard party band saved heavy metal, but he has written a new book that is the authorized biography of famed producer Ted Templeman. And Greg has very kindly decided to come back on the podcast because we want to promote him and we won't. We want to promote his book. We are joined, additionally, by two-time Leaders and Legends podcast guest and all-time great person, Mark Allen, former music critic for the Indianapolis Star and also the uh, wellspring of the website, the podcast, The Tapes Archive, which he came on just a few weeks to discuss. I've asked Mark to come on because his knowledge of this particular era of rock music is unparalleled and quite frankly, a hell of a lot better than mine. Mark, thank you for co-hosting. Greg, thank you for coming back on. You're welcome. Thank you guys for having me. Looking forward to it. Well, Greg, we're, this is a, this is a bipartisan podcast in the sense that even though I'm a Republican, I love having Dems on and talking about history and political science, but as a quasi Republican podcast, you plug your book shamelessly. <laughs> like we want to help you make money. So please don't hold back in talking about your book, talking about where people can get your book because you've been so generous with your time. We want to repay you in kind. Appreciate that very much. Thank you guys. Mark, you yep. have the football. Okay. So, uh, Greg, I guess we should start by asking what prompted a book about a record producer? So, um, when I did Van Halen Rising, one of the last interviews I did, I did 230 interviews for Van Halen Rising, something 230, 240. And uh, one of the in the last five or 10 people I interviewed was Ted Templeman. I was able to uh, get a contact number for him. He, you know, he doesn't have a website. He's just, you know, he's basically a retired record producer. And I was able to get an email address for him and I got in contact with him and he, he was like, yeah, I'll talk to you about Van Halen. Uh, oh, you're, you know, you're a historian. And, and so I talked to him and we did a good interview. It was about 45 minutes. And uh, some uh, months later, uh, you know, right before the book came out, he actually contacted me He'd heard a podcast that I had done where I talked about the book and somehow he had stumbled across the link. Um, he said, oh, I was wondering what happened with the book. You know, I didn't, we had maybe had said like, thank you after the initial email email exchange after the interview, but I didn't follow up with him about that stuff or anything like that. And it, it uh, turned out that he was, he had heard the interview and he was like, wow, this sounds really cool. Uh, can I get a copy of the book? And yes, of course you can have a copy of the book. And so sent him a copy of the book and he, he loved it. And uh, he's like, wow, you really, you know, you really get it. You really understood like the process that went into uh, how I worked with Van Halen and the making of their first record. And uh, he was kind enough to subsequently agree to come out to, the book launch in Pasadena, which was incredible uh, for me as a fan growing up in Van Halen and as a guy who wrote this book to have the the record producer of Van Halen sitting next to me at this book launch, signing books and talking to people. You know, it was basically like a, you know, mostly a Q and a kind of 
geared around him, you know, I, I, I chimed in, but obviously you know, people are deferring, you know, like, yeah, like, yeah, it's great. We can talk to you anytime on Facebook. We'll talk to the guy who we never see. Um, the guy who actually uh, made the record. And, uh, you know, after that, after that conversation uh, we had publicly, and then we talked a bunch after that, you know, I, I pitched him the idea about doing a book. And I said, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to do a book about your life because he started telling me about his early life in Santa Cruz, California, growing up a musician. He would send me emails, you know, again, this is the weeks after the Van Halen book was out uh, about his, uh, his early um, years as a professional musician where he was actually a, a pop star of sorts for his band Harper's Bazaar had hit singles and then they were on television all the time and they toured the country and toured the UK and Europe. And uh, we talked about that stuff and I said, this is really you know, kind of interesting. And uh, at first he was very... Uh, you know, he's not a very high strung or, or uh, heavy handed guy, but he was kind of like, no, nah, you know, no one wants to do, you know, you don't want to do a book about me, basically, like find something interesting to do a book about, you know, he's very, you know, he's kind of um, uh, kind of modest in some, in some sort of way, despite his, his, his resume. And I said, well, you know, Ted, I said, actually, it is interesting if you think about it. And we talked about it and he said, OK, um, sure. If you want to think about doing a book with me, go ahead. And I sort of started and I, I kind of got the impression that he thought that I would like you know, kind of run out of steam and be like bored after like three, oh, well, you know, after about six weeks being like, yeah, you know, whatever. I moved on to do a book about whatever Led Zeppelin or something like that. I don't know, but uh, I never did. And I just kept at, uh, kept at it. And, uh, you know, we really spent a lot of time talking and emailing and, you know, I got to really appreciate the, the breadth of his life even further than I had before. And so, you know, that was the, the, the real thinking for me was in doing a book about a record producer was, this was more than a record producer. This was a guy who had been a pop star who had also been an executive in a record company because if you work for Warner Brothers at that time, they had a, they had an A&R staff of house producers. They had about five or six guys, Russ Teitelman, Lenny Warnker. There were a number of other people, you know, eight or nine guys who were basically, um, would sit around the conference tables who would be the people who would help figure out which bands would get signed. And then the bands that came in, not all the bands that signed to Warner Brothers would, would be work with these gentlemen, but you know, a lot of them did. They would basically would get assigned to one of these guys or would basically build a rapport with one of them and they would work with them. And so thinking about those different hats that Ted wore and his whole, his whole career, and of course the, and of course the resume, right? That was the other thing, obviously. I mean, it's like Van Morrison, Little Feet, Carly Simon, Cheap Trick, you go down the line, uh, just huge, huge resume of, of superstars that he worked with. That was the, the thing. So for me, you know, I didn't want to do a book either that was basically, and I, he didn't either do a book that was just, the private, the private life of a record producer where we're going to focus on all his private travails or whatever they were. I mean, they did obviously come up in the writing of the book, but it was, it was meant to be, and he, he would, I, he wouldn't have done a book like that. I know he would have been like, no, no way. Um, he, he's like, it, it's gotta be focused on the records. It has to be focused on the albums and the making of the records. And I think for, for him, he's so appreciative of the incredible talent that he worked with. And he, and I mean, he knows how fortunate he was to, to, uh, to work at that record company at that time, obviously, in history, it was you know, an incredible uh, perch to be to see the world of music from and to work. And so, I, to kind of preserve those stories and to talk about that working assessment. with Van Morrison, uh, of people, course, I've how, been using the how, uh, much he learned from them and how much he benefited, and hopefully, the artists benefited from those those working collaborations. So that was the so that was how the uh, the book came about. But you know, it wasn't meant ever meant to be just a you know a record producer story because I thought it was a lot more than that. Sure. Okay. So uh, we should probably establish what a record producer does, because I think there are a lot of people who don't understand what the role of producer is. And the role of producer can be many different things uh, from, from sound to, to babysitting. But um, talk about it a bit about what a record producer does. Sure. Yeah. So I'll, you know, I'll talk about it in relation to, to Ted. And I think that's the thing there's, you know, there's the whole, there's the Rick Rubin style of record producer where he sort of, you know, reportedly, you know, would lay, would, you know, during the Laking the Blacks, last Black Sabbath record, he would lay on the couch and listen to the songs and go to come back and talk to them about that. There's like all these different working methods. Um, but an idea basically what a record producer would do is someone who assesses the, the quality of a, of a artist's material, helps them choose songs for that, for a record may musically collaborate with them if they are a musician or somebody who's, you know, basically like, you know, sometimes even help write music or help arrangements and then shepherd the process of the album being made from point A to point Z of the process. And so, you know, my, my anecdote about Rick Rubin is there's all, you know, again, how this gets done is varies from person to person. Um, but for, for, um, 
for I think for most people, what they would really want to understand about that is it's about you know figuring what material showcases the artist talents the best. Obviously, the idea with a record producer would be we want to sell records. Um, you know, that may not they may not be a concern for every single artist, but obviously, the vast majority of artists are saying I'm making this if I'm having someone work with me because I want to make money and I want it to be heard. And then um, to think about everything along the way to just getting the record done from the checklist of basic tracks, overdubs, vocals, getting drum sounds. We talked about drum sounds, you know, how, how's the album going to sound? And then carrying it through, especially in the old days, through the process of finishing the record, which would be, would be mixing, mastering, test pressing. The, the producer would oversee all that stuff and then pursue basically so the record gets handed to the record company that, to, to go to the, the pressing plant. So yeah, the record, the record producer was, you know, in some ways analogous to a, maybe to a uh, movie director, you know, somebody who's going to be involved with that moment to moment thing, but also is sort of the project overseer. In most cases, that person who is going to have to answer for, you know, it's not just like, Hey man, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just working with the artists making the music in theory, especially with someone who is an executive at a record company, you're responsible for making sure the deadlines get met, the budgets get kept appropriately. And then that the process ends with a record being delivered that can be sold. So, so Ted Templeman was a musician, as you mentioned, Harper's Bazaar, and he made the transition to producer. Why did he do that and how did he do that? Yeah, that's a really interesting, that's another interesting part of the, uh, of his story. And that was one thing I was really interested in when he was telling me. So, you know, Ted is pretty honest in the book about the fact that he, while he is a, was quite a talented musician, he wasn't necessarily cut out to be a pop star. So he was a guy who grew up, grew up as the jazz phenom in Santa Cruz, California, a local kid who would be the 11 year old kid playing with the 20 year olds playing the jazz hits of the day, big band music. Um, and, and as his um, life progressed and he got into his teens, he got into the Beatles, his early 20s, and he formed a group in Santa Cruz called the Tiki's with some friends of his. The Tiki's went on to become a band called Harper's Bazaar, which had some hits on Warner Brothers in the late 60s. They had a, 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 maybe a number 13 hit, I think, with the song Feeling Groovy, which was a Simon Garfunkel cover. And so, you know, talking to Ted about those years, he talked about how, how obviously how cool it was that, you know, you go from being total unknowns to being on, on um, to being on television, uh, primetime television to performing in these festivals with all the stars of the day uh, to performing in stadiums with Bob Hope and these kind of variety show type things that they were putting on in the sixties. But, you know, from, from when you talk to Ted about that, he tell me, you know, he, he never felt confident in his voice. In other words, he can sing, he can carry a tune and he uh, would basically make clear to me that, you know, I, I didn't have a voice to front the band yet. I was the guy, one of the guys fronting the band and so when Harper's Bazaar kind of wrapped up, Ted was really already had already seen himself hopefully transitioning into what you would call the other side of the glass, that he wanted to go from being a musician to being a producer or an engineer. And so that was his his aspiration. And actually, during the time he was in Harper's Bazaar, he would be the, the guy who would kind of stay after school, so to speak, where they'd be done recording. They could, in theory, leave, but Ted would stay with the producer. Yeah, so the whole time that Ted was working as a performer he was really much more interested uh, as a a musical person in what was going on in the recording studio i mean he 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 told me particularly that was really the thing that kept him interested in staying and going on with harper Bazaar more than his loyalty to his friends he was in the band with but that he uh he really loved making the records and so the whole time he was he was uh you know going out and and playing these these shows to these fairly large crowds and having uh, opportunities to be on television, these types of things, Ted would really love to get back to Los Angeles where they would make the records. And so Ted was the guy who would stay, stay after the sessions. So we would have, uh, you know, three, four hours where those guys would record songs and then everyone else would leave and Ted would stay with the engineer and the producer, Lenny Warnker in particular, who was Ted's mentor was producing the Harper's Bazaar records. Ted uh, really, took to him they became very good friends and ted really really tried to basically soak up as much knowledge as he could from lenny there's a couple of engineers as well who ted became very good friends with and that was really ted's uh you know ted's focus was how do you get a good drum sound how do you sequence a record how do you think about assessing the quality of a performance from the the standpoint of a producer rather than someone who's singing and so when uh when harper's bazaar 
did break up in 1970, Ted wanted to try to break into record production or engineering. And uh, that was where he, he started to make that transition. And he actually started as a tape listener, which was a, was a step, away, you know, actually many steps away in theory from being a record producer, but he took a, basically an entry level job at Warner brothers going from being one of their hit makers for a short period of time to a guy who was in a windowless room listening. In fact, he didn't even have an office at first. He had to work at home listening to tapes of, uh, submissions from from aspirational artists wanting to try to be on Warner Brothers and Ted was trying to find bands to sign. Uh-huh. So sort of like a uh, baby A&R. Uh... Yeah, I mean, really, that's what it was. I mean, it was it was a $50 a week job with boxes of tapes all day long, listening and listening. And that's when one of the tapes that Ted heard in the first few months he was doing that was from a band from san jose called the doobie brothers he heard a four song demo from uh from them really liked especially the first song on the tape which is a song called nobody and uh he brought it to lenny warnker and uh lenny warnker would bring that tape to the heads of warner brothers and they would go and eventually that band would get get signed and so ted was the guy who in theory found or discovered the doobie brothers in this tape that was submitted to warner brothers so the doobies were the first group that he produced is that correct Correct. Right. And he did what he did before he started that Doobie Brothers record. He was actually doing um, some session work. Actually, he actually worked on a Nancy Sinatra record, did a couple other things, kind of working as a session musician. But when he really yeah, when he uh, got the chance, which was that basically because Lenny Warnker had liked the Doobie Brothers as well, they went to the heads of Warner Brothers and the heads were like, sure, Lenny, you, you want to sign these guys, we'll sign these guys. And then uh, the idea became that Ted would be the quote unquote co-producer, which would basically mean like he was the the person going to work alongside Lenny in the studio with Lenny being the experienced person, Ted being the very junior person just learning. And that was the first record that he worked on as a producer, right? Which was the first Doobie Brothers record, which came out in uh, the spring of 1971. But but the real pivotal record for his career, I mean, the thing that got him going was Van Morrison, right? Correct. Correct. Tell that story because that's a really interesting kind of unusual collaboration that they had. I mean, Van Morrison was, is a pretty strong personality. Uh, Tell that story. So after the Doobie Brothers album came out, it really didn't do all that well. And Ted took that pretty hard. Uh, He, in the book, he's pretty, pretty clear about the fact that he, you know, he personally made, you know, mistakes. I mean, obviously it was a co-production situation. He felt like he had made some mistakes in the process and yet, um, one of the people in, in particular at Warner Brothers was a gentleman by the name of Joe Smith, who was uh, was very high in the eventually, you know, was basically the second or third person on the roster at Warner Brothers and uh, had a long had a long career in the industry. And Joe Smith had been the gentleman who had actually um, shepherded Van Morrison onto Warner Brothers, basically away from his previous record contract. And Joe, and, and Joe Smith was the guy who got uh, Van Morrison signed. And so Joe had taken a liking to Ted and actually introduced Ted and Van Morrison. And in, up in uh, Fairfax County where Van Morrison was living, they hung out at, at Van's house, this is Joe Smith and a few other people, and, and Van and Ted started to talk. Turned out they had a very similar interest in music. Van obviously is known, um, you know, he's a lead, a lead belly guy, and he's a, he a big blues background, but also he had a quite a, uh, a love for jazz. And a lot of the records that Ted had grown up on, Van Morrison had grown up on, so they really connected over that. and. Uh, Eventually, Van was was looking for someone to produce, and what I kind of understood from from talking to Ted about that was that Van, you know, Van obviously was a very strong willed person, and it was kind of clear that the the record company wanted somebody with Van, you know, to kind of like oversee things. But it was going to be pretty clear that Van it was going to be a very much a co production situation, and Van was going to be, you know, Van was going to have some pretty heavy input. But he, you know, he took a liking to Ted. Ted got a chance to produce Tupelo Honey, and so that was the first album um, that would really would really uh produce a hit for ted was was the tupelo honey album that would be the wild night would be the song that hit top 20 and that was the ted templeman van morrison production but you know van was obviously performing singing and ted was on the you know on the studio side behind the board when those stuff was going on yeah Uh, now the the thing with the first doobies is there's really not a hit song on that Mm -mm. but the second record he started to have some they started to write some songs that that could become hits yeah, I mean that's really in, in many ways that's I think the, the the was the big calling card for Ted's career at that point. That was really what made you know I think I think particularly because the Doobies were kind of coming out of nowhere at that point. With Van Morrison, obviously he'd had a career, and I'm not trying to take anything away from Ted, but obviously 
you have a proven artist and you produce a record with him, that's one thing. But when you have an unknown band that actually their first record flopped, that you're able to turn around and have a monster hit with the second one. Yeah, Toulouse Street was a was a uh, interesting situation because actually the Doobies had decided to produce it on their own. Actually, they had decided, well, we're going to do it on our own. They were doing it up in uh, up north, and uh, the album when they basically submitted the first round of, of demos or the first, basically the first recordings, the Warner brothers was like, uh, we don't really like this stuff when I was coming together. And uh, from what I understand from Ted, it was, you know, Ted said, Hey, I'll, 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 I'll work with those guys again if they want to uh, want to want to have, uh, have me work with them. And they said, yeah. And Ted came in and that's when, uh, you know, the, uh, those sessions were the, we're going to produce hits, like listen to the music, rock it on the highway, uh jesus is just all right and those songs were just am radio staples in that that time period 1972 73 and so yeah that would become the the big hit album that made ted templeman's reputation because again the first record had been so you know as you said no hits no hit singles and it had been basically they you know, they had toured quite a bit to the doobies and it just never really connected at all but um to come out of nowhere like that with those guys it was a it was a huge a huge success and a big confidence booster for ted because obviously after the doobies you have a chance the first record and it doesn't do all that well, you know, to kind of know that you're the guy now, you know, you're producing, it's you, it's on you. The, the doobies are looking to you to produce it. And for it to be so successful was a great confidence booster for him. So what did he do exactly to, I mean, it, did he recognize those songs and, and what did he do to the sound to make those songs what they are? I mean, 50 years later, we're still listening. to. Them. You know, I think, one of the things that was really so instructive for me in talking to Ted Templeman was he really explained to me what the identifiability factor was for the bands that he produced that really drew that drew him to the band and how he tried to accentuate them. So for example, with the Doobie Brothers, he talked about how the two-part harmonies, the, the Tom Johnson and the Pat Simmons harmonies, was something that kind of harkened back for him with uh, with Harper's Bazaar. They did a lot of harmonies in Harper's Bazaar, and he wanted to accentuate that. They did it on their own, but he thought that was really, really cool and interesting. He also liked the, uh, they had a, in their influence, they had a, you know, a Moby Grape influence. They really were kind of like, so that Bay Area kind of psychedelic y, Santana esque stuff. And I think Ted sort of played that down, a bit, you know, more on the second record than it was on the first record and uh, had been played up maybe a little bit more. But the other thing that, that Ted really liked was the, he thought that the Tom Johnson's kind of acoustic riffs, Tom wrote only pretty much totally on acoustic guitar, you know, like in his bedroom. And so Tom, uh, he really wanted to kind of accentuate that, those, uh, for lack of a better term, that kind of chunk of chunk of rhythm stuff. So like all those, um, like rocking on the highway, all those kind of like uh, percussive rhythm stuff that Tom Johnson did and kind of parallel that with the, with the harmonies. And again, I think the other thing, as you, as you point out, is the, are the songs. I mean, I think, I think, for for better for worse the doobies first group of songs there were some good stuff in there and the album didn't sound probably as good as it, it should have sounded but the material that got cu called together for the second record was better I mean, it was just better stuff and i think ted had a better probably had a better handle on what those guys could do i you know i think that's the other thing when i i spent a ton of time talking to ted about this you know it, it, it as he said it takes a while to get your sea legs i mean you you know you can think like he said you know with the first record just because you've made a record or you've sung on a hit or you've been on the studio and you've been, you know, quote unquote, running the board as a, you know, as a quote unquote junior engineer or just, you know, whatever he was doing, he said, it doesn't make you qualified to, to produce a record. It's like the whole psychological aspect of working with a band, really trying to think on a much, much bigger scale um, was things that he said just takes a while, you know, and, and there are, uh, I think, a lot of um, reasons to, to point to that second Doobie Brothers record to say it started to come together for Ted where he really started to kind of get, you know, kind of hit his, hit his, um, hit his stride in terms of being able to do that. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think without question, there's no comparison between the songs on the first Doobie Brothers record. I mean, there's nobody and there's a couple of other songs that, you know, may have, may have survived in the Doobie's catalog, but obviously this from here on out, there was just a run of, a run of hits. And this was just a, this was a monster, monster record for these guys. Absolute monster. Right. And, and it's interesting because it goes against conventional music business wisdom, which is you have 20 years to write your first album and six months to write your second. And whatever happened with the doobies between those two records, I mean, it was quite clear that their songwriting had evolved and become so much better. 
I mean, uh, infinitely. Well, and the other thing too to think about here is that you know, and, and Ted was, um, you know, wants to give credit to the artist, but I know that he definitely would have worked on them and did work with them with their, the arrangements. You know, the Doobies, their earlier material, especially their live stuff, they would jam. You know, they were kind of like, I mean, they were kind of like a Santana-esque band where they would do these sort of, mm -hmm. they would get into these grooves, as you might imagine, that Bay Area psychedelic stuff where they would go and kind of do this longer, longer stuff. And Ted really focused on, you know, like listen to the music, rocking the highway. They were very, you know, they were tight songs that were actually perfectly suited to am radio i mean they really were and that's where the doobies made their bones was they became you're not really like what you would call um what it would have been called experimental fm or whatever it would have been called at the time they sort of you know they'd play like you know they'd play like a nine minute zeppelin song or something like that that was that was not for am radio this was really the, the pop hit stuff and that's where ted i think really had an ear for that stuff and really said okay this is this is a good hook this is a good riff this is the good stuff and you know um listen to the music um, Jesus is just all right, which I think was a song actually the Doobies suggested, but that, you know, that one, another one that just sort of really hit that sweet spot for AM radio for those guys. And, you know, that's again, getting back to what a record producer does, it's about assessing the quality of the material. And Ted obviously did a really amazing job because that's a, you know, that's one of those records you can listen front to back and it's even the album tracks are great. Yeah. And then, I mean, his, he went through uh, and produced a lot of different bands. I mean, a lot of different artists and, and uh, and sounds. So I don't want to go through everybody, but I, I think it's important to note. Um, let's say Little Feet. Okay, Little mm. produce Sail and Shoes. Sail and Shoes is a fairly raw album, though he was doing the same thing. You know, the first Little Feet album had sold poorly, and they brought him in. I think to to make it a little bit more commercial. I'm not sure it's much more commercial, but. Um, and then later, about five, four or five albums later, he produced "Time Loves," uh, "Time Loves a Hero," right? And they couldn't be more different albums. <laughs> it's almost like a different band. And so, so if you could talk a little bit about the the production of those and how that, you know, how maybe how he evolved and maybe how he saw bands evolving. And, and, you know, kind of explain that, because I think that'll really, you know, if, if people need to understand what a producer does, this, this is, to me, that's the parallel. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think the big, the big factor there is the front man or the, the kind of the main figure in Little Feet was Lil George. And Lil George is one of these people who, honestly, he really should be a household name, considering the amount of songs he wrote, um, that are kind of staples or staples in the seventies. And, and I, um, you know, the, maybe the, maybe the most famous song he wrote was a song called Willin that was been done by, uh, probably most famously by Linda Ronstadt, but, um, Steve Earle has done it, I think. And it's just, it's one of these songs that'll, you know, a hundred years from now, people will be, will be playing it. I have no doubt. It's just a great song. And Lowell, um, was really instrumental in fronting and making little feet that kind of quirky, funky bluesy rocking band that they were on the, on the second record now what ended up happening between sail and shoes which came out in 72 and time loves a hero which would come out in 77 is that lowell george had unfortunately started to get ill which you can read between lines he was having you know problem with substances and uh he he sort of had to take a back seat in Little Feet and what ended up happening with some of the other guys in Little Feet, Billy Payne, their, their keyboard player, for instance, um, really started to come to the forefront as writing more. And they were, they were, they had sort of become an, um, intrigued by jazz and fusion. So a lot of the material on Time Loves a Hero is much more, you know, probably akin closer to Weather Report than it is to something like the Rolling Stones, which in kind of a very vague sense, the first Little Feet record is probably a little closer to what the Rolling Stones were sounding like in the early 70s than, than, uh, than anything else I could think of off the top of my head. And so, you know, it was part of it was what Ted got dealt as a producer with the second record. I mean, Ted talked about how he was continually trying to get Lowell to write and to contribute more to that record. Um, and there's one very amusing story, if you guys will let me let me tell it about Lowell's work with the, with the making of the Time of the Hero record. So yeah, so Lowell... Um, you know, Lowell had been, he's the heart and soul. He was, he basically was in a lot of ways, Doobie Feet in the seventies with Lowell George in terms of like the, the songwriting and the sort of the personality, the quirkiness of it. And uh, he wasn't, he wasn't well in 1976, 77. And so Ted was constantly 
arguing with him to come to the studio more. And when Lowell would show up, according to Ted, he would be complaining about the music going, this sounds like weather report. I don't like, you know, he didn't like the material and Ted was actually, you know, getting pissed off basically going, Lowell, you're, you're sick or whatever, you know, you've been sick and you haven't showing up. You're not feeling well. Well, you can't just come walk in here every fifth day and then basically start complaining about the songs. It's your band, but you're not here. Um, <laughs> and then there was, a, so Lowell, uh, Lowell did write this one song called Rocket on My Pocket and that Ted had cut for the, for the album and Lowell, uh, Lowell hadn't done the solo. It would be like the last thing to put on the record would be this slide solo. And uh, Ted kept calling Lowell and Lowell wouldn't come up to the studio. So uh, Ted probably smartly figured, okay, I got an idea. He called Bonnie Raitt, who was a great slide player. She came in and played the part. Now, I, you know, I, Ted couldn't remember whether someone called Lowell or Lowell found out. You know, Ted wasn't necessarily going behind Lowell's back, but I'm not sure he picked up the phone and told Lowell, but somebody told Lowell. <laughs> Apparently Lowell got out of bed immediately and came down to Sunset Sound or Amigo, whichever they cut at the Warner Brothers Studio in Hollywood in his pajamas with an overcoat on. <laughs> he suddenly strapped on his guitar and played the solo because he didn't want Bonnie Raitt's solo being on the record. And so, you know, Ted was basically going, yeah, that's one of the, you know, the tricks of the record producer. You go, okay, you're not going to do this. I'll just get somebody else to come in here and do it. And, uh, you know, so uh, maybe one day we'll ever hear that Bonnie Raitt solo that was done on, uh, I'm rocking my pocket, but um, you know, that's really the reason why those two records sound so different. But, you know, another thing I would, I would try to illustrate there is that one of the things that's really interesting about Ted Templeman is that, you know, uh, and this is no criticism of these, these uh, men I'll ne- or individuals I'll mention, uh, you know, uh, Mutt Lang, uh, for example, has kind of a characteristic sound, right? There's the drum right. sound. There's definitely, you listen to a, a song you could hear when Mutt Lang did Shania Twain, it sounded kind of you know vaguely in the, the 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 sound like a deaf leopard in some way it's not exactly but there was like you could tell like it was a mutt lang production and bob they, rock bob yeah, rock exa- makes the yeah. same yeah right and we love right bob rock we love we love these producers because they have that that certain you know the record's going to sound good well ted really never did that i mean he really the record's pretty much you know he really always tried to get a feel for the artist's material and so he didn't try to make um you know the classic example is he didn't try to make Van Halen sound like the Doobie Brothers or maybe another even better example is he produced Sammy Hagar and he produced Van Halen around the same time and they he didn't you know try to go I'm going to basically put my imprint a Mike Chapman-esque imprint on this and go this so so when little you listen to the first uh the first album Ted did with Little Feet Sailing Shoes versus Time of the Hero they don't even sound that similar I mean they're definitely yeah. there's not a um it was definitely much more of a, a Steely Dan-esque smoother sounding recording with Time Loves a Hero versus uh versus uh you know which much more of a raw i think more of an early 70s bluesier um sound to the first little feed record even how it sounds like guitars are more kind of prominent in the mix and how they're up in the headphone the mix and stuff like that versus the time of the hero record which much more the smooth edges are much the rough edges are much more been polished off okay i just want to ask two or three other things and then we'll we'll segue into the van halen stuff yay uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um but before i talk about van halen quite a bit so i'm happy to yes. talk about you know yeah. this i love this stuff no uh so before he worked with eddie van halen he worked with another great guitar player in captain b mm-hmm. and that's i mean you talk about a range of producers if the guy can go from carly simon to captain b i mean that's an insanely wide gap but, but would you talk about uh, about uh, what he did with uh, with that Captain Beefheart record and 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 getting that sound out of uh, Zoot Horn Rollo? It, it's it's sort of an extraordinary record and it's a totally weird record, but it's it's a record worth listening to. Yeah, um, you know, I don't even remember if Ted ever told me or Ted could remember how he ended up becoming the producer for Beefheart. Obviously, you know, they reprise, which the Warner Brothers subsidiary had signed Beefheart and Beefheart was on the label. And obviously they had met and somebody suggested Ted would might work with them. You know, again, at that point, Ted was doing a lot of records. Like he was in the studio all the time. He was doing the Doobie Brothers. He was doing Little Feet. He did, um, um, you know, the, the Beefheart record. And there was one more that's kind of, oh, Lorraine Ellison, who was, was kind of a gospel-esque, um african-american woman who uh had uh had a hit in the 60s and ted did her record as well so ted was was taking on these projects in part i think you know as he told me he really wanted to prove himself and that you know kind of you're the new the new person when people say do you want to do the beef art record you don't go no you go yes he's notoriously difficult he hasn't had a hit 
yes, I'll take, you know, you want to be, you want to say, I'm ready to take on the challenges. And so, um, you know, he, he told me that, uh, yeah, it was, it was, he, you know, he would sometimes change these stories about in, in his mind. Cause when he would talk about different records, he might be remember something that aggravated him. And, but, you know, generally if I talked to him, he would say this was, this was in his like top two most difficult records to make because of the personality of beef heart was like, <laughs> just like, it was out there. Um, you know, uh, but the sound, uh, let's talk about the sound of the record. I mean, I really want to make sure to mention here, this is where uh, at this point, Ted has partnered up with Don Landy, who is without a question, one of the great unsung heroes of rock and roll. Uh, Don and Ted had met in 1968, I believe, when Don was working as an engineer uh, in a Hollywood studio, and he was brought in to put phasing, which is sort of this whooshing, sort of swirling sound that you heard in a lot of recordings in the, in the 60s on uh, Knock on Wood, the doobies, had, excuse me, the uh, Harper's Bar had covered Knock on Wood, and, and that's where Don and Ted met, and eventually Ted and Don became became working partners. Little Feet, uh, and then Beefheart. They did the second Doobie Brothers record together, and uh, th- I mean that's the thing that makes that record. I think the guitar sounds on that record so extraordinary too. Is you had Ted who had great ears, obviously, and really knew what he wanted in a mix, but also Don who was just, as Ted said uh, numerous times in the book, is a genius. I mean, he just was an absolute genius, uh, an extraordinary engineer. One of these guys who there's 500 engineers walking around Hollywood. And this guy is going to be one of the two or three who can get the best bass sound out of anybody. He was just he was just super super talented and super intuitive, um, you know. But the the beef heart idea for Ted, you know, that was that Ted's goal was to try to get a hit for beef heart, you know, and that was sort of you know some of the other stuff, obviously. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and that was the and that was the idea. And that's what too much too much time was. If you, there's that song, um, it sounds sort of like a stack song or a Motown song called "Too Much Time." Russ Titleman actually, who's one of the house producers for Warner Brothers, played guitar in that kind of this, um, you know, this kind of uh, Wrecking Crew style guitar part in there. And that, But that was the idea to try to get Beefheart exposed to a wider audience. But the book is full of, <laughs> full of stories. And some I couldn't even, like, honestly couldn't even put in the book because I'd be like, you know, the guy's passed away and you just, you don't want to, like, completely, you like, but, you know, like Ted, yeah, I mean, it wasn't, and, and you know, Ted, res- and Ted had respect for him. He just was like, he was like, you know, just a little bit, a little bit off kilter, a little bit, and so as they approach things, I mean, the, the 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 one story that people will enjoy hearing. There's a number of them in the book. Is the is the taco story, where uh, so uh, they're on a break, and so Ted is not in the, the control room. He's in the in the studio room, the big room where the drum set would be and the guitar amps and everything. And they'd be standing around and talking and getting ready to cut a track or whatever it was. They're going to do another another take of something, and Ted was out there talking to them and saying, "Look, well, you know, you do this or whatever." And uh, Beefheart was there. And uh, he looked over at, I, I think, the, I think his guitar player. I can't remember who it was. I, I, I name, whoever it is escapes me. But one of the, uh, <laughs> and he goes, "What'd you have for lunch?" Goes, tacos. He goes tacos. And Ted swears he like hit him in the face, like basically smacked him across <laughs> the face and knocked the guy over. He flew off his chair on the ground, and. <laughs> The guy got back on a stool and, and kept going. I mean, he said that, you know, Ted said that Beefheart was, was a tyrant. Like he basically had those guys psychologically kind of uh, worked over. Like he was a, he was a real tyrant and, uh, you know, like to basically um, dominate the guys in the band like that. But there were a number of stories that were way, way out there. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, especially the thing to think about with that is that Ted Templeman was a guy who grew up on, on Latin jazz. So there's a lot of percussion uh, on that record too. And that may not be, I don't know Beefheart's catalog from front to back. So, you know, it may be that Beefheart had done a lot of this stuff before, but you can kind of, when I hear it and I was talking to Ted about that, he was like, yeah, I really wanted to bring that sort of that, those like, um, you know, that Bo Diddley stuff, but really kind of like even make it thicker with the type of percussion, the congas and the other things he was laying on top of those, those tracks. But um, yeah, it's a great record. It's an incredible sounding record. And I always tell people, um, you know, Big Lebowski. It's uh, there's a there's one of the songs from there is uh, is eyes are a blue yeah. million miles. Well, yeah. Eyes are blue million miles, Crazy. and uh, you know, Crazy Little Thing. All these songs. I mean, it is it is it is out there. But yeah, Ted said it was <laughs> it's not easy to make the record. No, and uh, I can't even imagine. And uh, but but I, what I wanted to say, and Robert, you got to go when when we're done with this. Listen to a song from that album. The album's called Clear Spot. And listen to a song called Big Eyed Beans from Venus. And listen to the guitar on that song. That's why this guy was considered one of the great guitarists in rock. And hardly anybody's heard of him, but he's amazing. Anyway, 
I uh, promise. More. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Robert. No, I was going to say, I promise I'll listen to it. When you said Captain Beefheart, I'd never heard of. And I was thinking, Mel Gibson, what the hell does he have to, which, <laughs> which is Mark, why you're on the podcast it's, it's today. An, I'll tell you too. Uh, it is an, inc- it is again, a testament to Ted's uh, ability as a producer and Don Landy's producer as an uh, ability as an engineer, because this is a phenomenal sounding record. The vocal, the, the voice, I mean, the way they captured Beefheart's voice. It and it's bizarre. <laughs> Like, and it's the it most like accessible, right? Isn't it like the most accessible oh, way, record of all? Way more bizarre. Way more bizarre it, than Zappa? Uh, yes, it, it's probably the most successful record. It's certainly the most commercial thing or close to commercial thing that he ever did. Um, but no, I mean, this is this is way out. <laughs> it's not, I mean, he's he's gone further out, but this is way out. You know, and there's the great sense of humor too with, uh, with B-Fart 2, which... You know, some of it may not be politically correct today where you talk about, uh, you know, sometimes a woman's got to hit a man. Like you basically talk about like all this stuff that like, you know, like, or, uh, you know, uh, you know, it just, if you listen, there's like a real humor to it too, which is, is, it's kind of hard to, you can't really, it's hard to put it to words, but if you listen to it, I mean, he, he had a very odd way of seeing the world. There's no question about it. There was, you know, a very uh, unique thing. I'll tell you one other quick thing, which is that Beefheart went on to become quite, a successful artist like his, mm-hmm. his paintings are extremely valuable and uh don landy sent me a uh, a scan of a picture that he had given don a very hard time during the recording and i guess beefart had a moment where he sort of felt badly about that and he drew a drawing this is before beefart became kind of a famous artist but beefart was still draw and he drew this this thing was all these colors splashed all over the page and he goes he goes don you know this is what you see when I sing or something. I gave him this like drawing and like, you know, of course I told Don, I said, if you're ever looking for your, like, you know, your final retirement trip around the world, you probably sell that. It's probably worth a lot of money, but um, yeah, it, it was, it was not easy to make that record. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now let's transition into Van Halen. So Templeman has worked with this huge variety of people. Nobody you would say was metal or even hard rock, really. I mean, it was, it was, there was a California sound, there were Carly Simon, there was Beefheart, there were a lot of things in between. So, how does he end up produ- finding and producing this band that's, that's going to revolutionize or, or really reinvent hard rock? So, he, uh, at the point in, he gets a call. It's 1977. He gets a call from an old friend of his, a guy by the name of Marshall Burrell, who would go on to manage Rat and uh, you know have have a career in the music industry himself. He worked uh, managed the whiskey for a while, and he uh, Marshall was working on the Sunset Strip and had heard this band called Van Halen and thought the the uh, the band was talented. And he called Ted and he said, "Look, Ted Marshall wasn't managing the band or anything like that. He didn't have an investment in them, but he just said, look, he said." Uh, you know, I think these guys have, have talent. You should come check them out. And Ted had known Marshall from back in the 60s. Marshall was a booking agent and Ted had known him. And Ted said, you know, I talked to Marshall quite a bit, you know, over the, those years and kind of knew Marshall had good ears. So I said, what the hell, I'll go check out this band. Now, at the time, you know, Ted made clear to me he was ma- making as many as two records at the same time where he'd be in one studio in the morning, one in the afternoon or the evening, going to meetings. He said, I didn't go and, you know, I wasn't on the street. It wasn't like I was like, going to clubs, standing in the back, listening to, to, to bands. But I said, you know, it was the late end, end of the night on a Monday night, you know, uh, Marshall said, they'll be playing, come hear them in on the Sunset Strip. And Ted went down there and he said he was just absolutely blown away by the guitar playing. And uh, for Ted, he said when he saw Eddie Van Halen play guitar, it harkened back to the great jazz uh, guys like Charlie Parker, uh, who he said that would, that sort of way that Ed Van Halen kind of, wasn't a conventional blues rock player. He was a guy who kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, was kind of blending, you know, maybe like a fusion-y type of approach to the guitar with a really, really souped up hard rock, you know, maybe Rich Bla- Richie Blackmore meets, you know, some some of the jazz get, jazz guys. And Ted said he was just, just blown away by the talent and said he thought the band was good, but he was just focused on the guitar players. He said it was so unusual the way he played and how he did stuff. He just said, this guy is, how is this not, you know, something that the people have kind of picked up on. Well, the the truth of the matter was that other people had seen Van Halen. They didn't love the singer. They also didn't love uh, the guitar playing because it was sort of, it didn't sort of fit into a pop box. It wasn't sort of like a, you know, like a, something that you could easily put on the radio, the way Eddie Van Halen played. People thought it was too abrasive. It was really too adventuresome. And so 
many many people passed on the band or people did you know were like this isn't this isn't going to be something that's going to be marketable and so uh you know as soon as ted saw van halen he went back and told mo austin who was head of warner brothers and said you got to come see this band with me the next night and they did and uh that's how uh ted got into to signing them but you know ted uh had also worked with montrose previously which was a a hard rock band and had liked had liked working with them those guys had never really connected in the way that ted had hoped and so he just was really he said intrigued by the band particularly the guitar player and wanted to take a shot at doing another another type of hard rock hard rock band but uh yeah it was from a phone call and he went down there and just he he kind of he saw what other people didn't see which was the the you know or see in terms of a commercial potential was the the guitar playing and the talent of the band robert You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest on the Leaders and Legends podcast is Greg Renoff, who uh, previously came on to talk about his book, uh, Van Halen Rising, how a Southern California backyard party band saved heavy metal. He is on today to talk about his new biography of Ted Templeman, the famous music producer. It's available on Barnes and Noble, Goodreads, Amazon, and it's called Ted Templeman, A Platinum Producer's Life in Music. Uh, As you've listened so far, Templeman has worked with bands and artists you've heard of, Doobie Brothers, Montrose, Van Morrison, Carly Simon. But of course, we are now talking about his most important discovery for all of us who grew up in the 70s and 80s, and that is the seminal rock band van halen you also mentioned earlier greg about the the book signing and the book event you did for your van halen rising book in which ted templeman uh comes and sits with you and does a q a that is available on youtube guys look that up you will really enjoy watching that exchange uh, I've watched it two or three times. It It is very, very informative. There's one thing you can say about Ted Templeman. He just says it. I mean, he has the credibility and has the track record to be completely and totally honest. And he was. You mentioned just a few minutes ago about the discovery of Van Halen uh, famously, as they even stated in their debut album, they were spotted by Gene Simmons of Kiss and that didn't work out. What was the difference between how Ted Templeman produced Van Halen and the demos that were produced by Gene Simmons? Well, first thing I would, you got to give Gene, Gene never is a uh, shy about giving himself credit, but we'll give Gene <laughs> credit because Gene did, Gene did see the talent. Right? Gene saw the potential there. Um, and so about four months or so before Ted, saw Van Halen. Gene had had encountered them around Halloween of 1976. Ted would sign the, you know, basically be instrumental in the band being signed around February of 77. And, uh, you know, one thing that Gene did is that Gene basically whisked them right to New York to start working on a, uh, a record. I mean, basically it was, okay, guys, let's go. Let me hear your songs. Let's go. And, uh, you know, Gene put together a demo tape without really having the ability to do any pre-production meaning that he didn't, which is also something a record producer would do, which is you would sit with the band, listen to their rehearsals, listen to their demos, and help them figure out what's their best songs and what's their worst songs. So Gene didn't have a lot of time to do that. And and also, I think, you know, the thing is that Gene was really not locked in on the way the band musically operated, which was that it was really an axis between, musically between Alex and Eddie, that they were very much... Uh, had right. a very s- sympathetic musical relationship because they had grown up together. So unlike some bands where they knew the drummer, the guitar player played together for a couple of years, these guys have been playing together since they were little ki- little kids uh, musically. And so, you know, I think one of the things that, that Gene didn't really think about was that he wasn't get, trying to get Ed to really play as much with Alex the way he maybe should. I mean, obviously they're playing together, but 
I think when you listen to the first Van Halen record, there's a lot of stuff that Ed and Alex do together. A lot of little kicks, a lot of little syncopated parts that were all worked out and really locked in. I mean, they were really, um, that really came to the forefront with the first Van Halen record. Another thing too, I think um, the vocals. I mean, I don't think that that's kind of the elephant in the room. Um, Ted talks about in the book that he had definite uh, concerns about David Lee Roth as a vocalist when he first heard Van Halen and actually first worked with them in the studio as doing demos. And he didn't know if David Lee Roth would be even the right guy for Van Halen um, kind of on one level, but also he just didn't know if Dave was going to be able to pull it off. And if you listen to the way the vocals are on the Gene Simmons demo, they really are not that strong. Um, and one thing that Ted really worked on to make the difference between 1976, the fall, and then, you know, when they worked with them in the fall of 77. So Gene did the fall of six, 76 was that Ross vocals are, are, leaps and bounds better and i think you have to give a lot of credit to roth who who worked to improve i think there's no question about that that's a fact that he did work to improve that he saw that okay i gotta raise my game and he worked really hard ted was always very clear with me that roth was an incredibly hard worker and you know if you ask him to do something he did it and he he made sure he did it right he was never you know for all his quote-unquote party um image it wasn't like that when it came time to work like roth really would focus and would work and so what you had with a guy like Ted Templeman was a guy who had had been a singer himself and was a singer. And so I think he really tried to figure out how to get the song melodies and parts together in a way that Roth would be able to sing them and really, really sound his best. And that's really what you see here on the first Van Halen record to me is that it's, you know, you can kind of say, well, the guitar playing is better on the first Van Halen record, obviously. But to me, the biggest, the biggest and most shocking improvement is really Ross Ross vocal. So I think that's where, you know, the two things I would say is again, going back to what I said before about Gene didn't have a lot of time with them. And, uh, you know, maybe if Gene had had six months to just hang around with those guys and, and do it, maybe he would have kind of caught on to some of the stuff Ted would have caught on to, but, but, uh, you know, Ted really spent enormous amounts of time rehearsing those guys in Ross basement. He would go over there all the time and then really worked, I think, to, to, to focus the, the, um, the album around Eddie Van Halen's guitar you know, make that really the centerpiece and also just figure out how to make Roth sound and be his best. And that was something that definitely uh, is was clear on the first Van Halen record. I recently uh, was watching the performance of Ice Cream Man from the Us Festival. <laughs> and one of the comments on YouTube was actually it's the very first comment, or at least it was basically stated, it's incomprehensible to me talking about the guitar solo in ice cream man which is my personal favorite in song solo from early van halen the commenter basically said it's incomprehensible to me that this solo was being played in backyards and in small clubs for years before we heard it on record i've also seen interviews with ted templeman where he said look the thing i really cared about with van halen was making sure that this genius eddie van halen got noticed like he deserved to be known yep. for his playing and mark uh, our mark allen the co-host for the podcast uh, you know he's not as big a van halen fan as i am but he's certainly a huge eddie van halen fan so how important was it to ted and did he talk about that in the book in some length like this guy is too good to be unknown. Eddie Van Halen is just too good to be playing in backyards and small clubs. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really, that runs through the entire chapter that we did on the first Van Halen record. But I will tell you too, that Ted for all artists, he taught in terms of context, I think of him as a producer writ large, he would talk to me about how the analogy he might use for himself as a, as a lighting man, which obviously is vastly understating his role. But he, he, he meant to boil it down and say, look, my job is to make the people who are performing look their best to the people who are trying to enjoy the performance. You know, and I think when he heard and saw Eddie Van Halen in the clubs and then worked with him, he, he said this guy is a game-changing musician. And that's meaning that this guy, Ted will said, just said, has said this to me, you know, in the last three weeks that, you know, Eddie Van Halen is one of the three or four greatest musicians of the 20th century in his mind and, and you know that might be a controversial comment to a lot of people um but that's where ted's coming from where he thinks about that and that was one of the reasons why he really wanted to showcase uh the guitar playing i mean the guitar is so big in the mix of that first van halen record and that's one of the reasons obviously it's considered to be a landmark 
guitar record in so many ways. But even more so, I mean, I think that the irony of ironies of all this is that the one of the last songs they recorded for the record is uh, was Eruption, which when if you look at the tape boxes from Van Halen, when I've seen the, the scans of them, the pictures of them, it actually first said guitar solo. They didn't have a name for it. Eventually they named it Eruption. <laughs> who named but, it? Um, I don't know who named it, actually. I don't know. Um, I, I I don't know if the, the Ted remembered it. Maybe it probably one of the, you know, probably one of the guys in the band. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but interestingly enough, you know, Ted, when he heard Eddie Van Halen playing that in the studio, they were just basically, Eddie was just killing time. That was his live solo that he did on stage or some, you know, something like that was what he mm-hmm. would do on stage. He might change it from night to night, but that was basically what he would do when the other guys were getting beers backstage, you know, he and his brother would go out there and do this little guitar thing. And he would do this five or seven minute solo. Those guys would towel off and get a drink. And then they come back on stage and do the encores and they would leave. And when Ted heard that, he goes, what is this? He walked out in the studio and then what's this? Oh, it's just something I do on stage. What do you mean? It's just something you do. He's like, it's my guitar solo. It's just my live unaccompanied guitar solo. And he's like, we got to put in the record. And Eddie Van Halen was like, well, what? <laughs> he put in the record. It's not a, it's not a song basically. It's like, not, you know, it's why we would have put this in the record. And he's like, get ready, get the other guys. We're going to do this right now. You know, do you guys have a thing you do? Yeah. Yeah. We do this thing with the drums or the bass, whatever. You know, come on, get the guys. Let's go walk back in the control room. And, and, uh, Don Landy was already rolling the tape. Like Ted said, okay, let's get ready. We're going to record this. And Don's like, I'm already recording. Like Don and Ted were so locked in at that point that mm-hmm. obviously Don was standing in the control room, seeing Ted being animated talking about the scene he could tell that ted was suddenly like thinking like we're gonna do this and he immediately started rolling the tape but my you know that's a long-winded way of me saying is that that's what i mean he wanted to showcase the guitar i mean that was a thing it's like and, and the um, other thing too that's the second song on the album right which is you know usually a lot of times those things you know you have these types of little instrumental things you get to put it on the second side or you put it the back side of the record um it was meant to be it's run with the devil we're going to have this huge monster guitar riff and all these incredible out of this world screams from David Lee Roth on the first song. And then we're going to hit you with this guitar solo, which is going to be like, what is this? And that's really what happened. I mean, that's what I think is remarkable too about, and Ted deserves um, so much credit, you know, is that he heard what now is obviously self-evident to us, but at the time in 1977, other, other industry people, they didn't get it. Like, you know, yeah. this guy is incredible. This is an unbelievable you know, and that's because, again, Ted was a jazz musician and understood virtuosity. He understood sax players and trumpet players who played bebop and these guys who were just doing these unbelievable runs. And that to him, that's what he heard when he heard Eddie Van Halen play guitar. And so, um, you know, that was the that was the plan was to blow the guitar up, meaning that was going to be the showcase for the for the band. Um, you know, obviously, David Roth is going to fit in that that too as well. But that was what that was what sold him on Van Halen was Eddie Van Halen. If you also look up on YouTube, which apparently is what I do for my entire life, is look up stuff on YouTube, Seinfeld clips, concerts. I mean, I was watching Liberace play um, um, multiple songs just a couple nights ago. I mean, YouTube is one of the great time sucks of all time. I was watching Liberace play uh, Claire de Lune, a beautiful piece. If you look up the acoustic guitar solo on van halen 2 called spanish fly you the comments from guitarist will say i can play eruption no problem i can't even come close to this like this is so far beyond what i can play it's an interesting story because what i have read and please tell me i'm i'm remembering correctly or i'm remembering incorrectly and that is a lot of people kind of thought that Van Halen was produced and yeah, you're playing with all this distortion and in your amps and everything. So you're doing all these noises. In other words, how much of it is pure talent and how much of it is production with Spanish fly, the acoustic guitar solo on Van Halen too. There's none of that. It's just pure brilliance. And Eddie Van Halen tells a story where he was playing acoustic guitar, I think on New Year's Eve or something. And Ted says, oh, you can play acoustic. And they decided to record this solo. Is, is that story accurate? The way Ted told it to me, actually, I, I got to hold the guitar that Eddie Van Halen played, uh, which was incredible. Like, he's like, oh, yeah. He, you know, it was like, he's like, and this is the guitar. And he showed it. I was at, <laughs> doing the interview with Ted. And I like, <laughs> like let's take it, take it right to the Smithsonian. You know, whatever. That's because I'm a Van Halen geek, right? Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, that's basically the story was that uh, Ted 
had the guitar at the house. Ted had actually bought it in Europe when he had traveled to Europe in the early 60s and it was in the house. And of course, when Eddie Van Halen saw the, the guitar, like a, any guitar player who, who's obsessed or anyone who's obsessed with an instrument, you immediately want to play it. And he started playing it. And Ted was like, can you, can you do that same stuff? The hammers on, the hammer-ons you do? Ted always called them, it's called Tappy, called them hammer-ons. Can you do those hammer-ons you can do? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, I think so. And he like started doing all that stuff. And Ted was like, oh, we got to record this. You know, and I think again, Eddie was like, really? Really? <laughs> <laughs> we got to do this. And yeah. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that was, I think that was, you know, certainly maybe, maybe that was Eddie Van, I don't know, but maybe that was Eddie Van Halen's perspective. I never heard Ted say that to me personally, that he was trying to show everybody that Ed could do it on the acoustic guitar. He was just more, I think, just so blown away by the musicality of it, that this was, this guy was, you know, could, could uh, write another, another unaccompanied piece that was so, was so cool and so musical. So uh, to Ted, it was another, again, another no brainer to, uh, put that type of thing on the record the other thing i would tell you guys which i think you know probably most people including myself would never have even thought about or known about before um before i i kind of talked to ted about this is that you know ted talked about if you listen to the, the first couple harper the first the second harper's bizarre record in particular lenny wonker who produced the second harper's bizarre record the third one too had these little musical interludes there were these little like break points along the way and, and black sabbath did the same thing these little these little um things that break up the momentum of the record or not you know, break up the momentum, basically to, to basically make it not so uniform with one song after another. And so, right. you know, when that's one of the things that really was kind of characteristic of the Ted Templeman productions on those, those records, um, you know, going even to the, to Diver Down with the, with the Intruder and then with the, uh, with the introduction little of little guitars, you know, mm-hmm. these sort of things. So that was another, you know, uh, again, a showcase for Eddie Van Halen. Um, but it was, it was definitely something that Ted had kind of picked up on as a, as a musician, with the records that he did in the sixties himself, that they would have these little musical, you know, one minute musical interludes. When we were recording this, which is, it'll, it'll get uh, broadcast probably sometime in, in June of 2020. Uh, the, the stories have come out in the last few days, last week, based on your book about Ted Templeman, that there was a push, however, fleeting and soft, mm-hmm. At one point during the Van Halen one recording sessions to replace David Lee Roth with Sammy Hagar. That's the irony of all ironies, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's almost night gallery stuff. And so Templeman said that would have been the biggest mistake in music history. Why do you think he feels that way? Yeah, it's uh it is an interesting way, uh to think about how it all came full circle, obviously with the, with Sammy joining the band, you know, I think when Ted first heard Van Halen, he was totally focused on Eddie Van Halen. I mean, totally meaning that that was the selling point for him more than anything else. He liked the band, right? he liked the bass player. He liked the drummer. He thought they're good. He thought the band was good. He liked the songs. They heard her songs. I mean, he obviously, if he thought the band didn't have talent, you're not going to sign a band of Warner brothers. You don't think has talent. But right. for him, it was the guitar playing was the the most striking thing. It's like going to see a, you know, a band where the vocalist is like, you're like, oh my gosh, it's it's Barbara Streisand or something like that. She's so incredible. Of course, you know, the rest of the band is good, but it's Barbara Streisand. So we got to sign this Barbara Streisand person with the rest of her band. So, um, but when Ted got in the studio the first time with with Dave and they did demos for the first Van Halen record, he just didn't think a lot of the stuff was was that great. And he was worried that he wasn't going to be able to fix it basically that basically there, that Roth wasn't going to be able to cut it as a vocalist. And what ended up happening was that he, he said, okay, you know, uh, if worst comes to worst and this guy, meaning Dave continues to underperform in, in Ted's mind in terms of his ability to hit notes, you know, he's not a conventional singer. You know, we all know that right. about Roth It's sort of for what, or whatever Ted was thinking. He was just like, he's just, there were too many bum notes. He said, okay, uh, Ted kept it to himself probably told his engineer, Don Landy, whispered to him, you know, maybe I could call Sammy. And they were just, you know, it was one of the things he was mulling over. Like, okay, if things really go south, I want to make a record with this guy, this band. This is a good band. The singer, to me, is the weak point. And by the way, that's the same thing that Bill O'Coin said to Van Halen when he passed on them in the fall of 1976. Bill O'Coin, being Kiss's manager, said, oh, you know, you guys, you know, you got some songs and, you know, you got some talent, maybe, you know, especially the guitar playing is good, but, you know, it's, I, I don't think with the singing, I don't think it's that good. And, and you know, a coin, so both a coin and many other people who had heard Van Halen, not just Ted, were kind of like, oh, I don't love the singer. But what Ted told me is that he said, okay, 
you know what? I produced a lot of artists before. I'm going to figure out, see if I can make this work. I'm going to hang in here with this, you know, hang in with it. You're basically, I'm not going to do anything rash. And he never like, there was never any like plot to throw out David Lee Roth. It was more like, just like you're thinking over like, okay, let's think three to four steps down the road. Mm -hmm. What could I do to keep this thing going, this band going? Because I like this band. And so, but he, you know, he, at the time, this would be in the spring of 1977, Ted was spending a lot of time with those guys listening to their material. He would go to the house in Pasadena that Roth owned, go in the basement with those guys, the famous Roth basement where they rehearsed. And he would sit and listen to their material and he would take notes and he would talk to them and say, this is a good song. I don't love this song. And he said he would spend a lot of time talking to Roth and he just realized that they, this guy, this guy's really super smart. I mean, he's really like, you know, not the typical like rock. I mean, he had that sort of image, but he's like, he's like really intelligent. He was eclectic also writing taste in music for yeah, sure. Eclectic, right. And they had the same taste, a lot, of, a lot of the same records. They owned a lot of the same records. And he was reading these lyrics, things like atomic punk, um, ain't talking about love. You know, a lot of the stuff that Roth would, would wrote and was going to write that, that Ted was like, wow, these are, this is really, really good stuff. And so, you know, he quickly became uh, an advocate for Roth to go, okay, look, you know what? I'm, we're going to make this work. I'm going to make, the, I'm going to help this guy. And he's, he seems willing to work. And he was, obviously he was, and we're going to make this work. And uh, it went forth. And then, you know, he became a, a big champion of Roth and actually says in the book, you know, again, in just a matter of whatever weeks or a couple of months, he went from being like, I don't know about this to being like, this is the guy, this is the right guy. Because he just said, you know, it just fit with the rest of the group. And he said, you know, they wouldn't have made it without Sammy, uh, excuse me, without Roth. He wouldn't have made it without him. That if I had put, yeah, I mean, say that clearly. Let me make sure I say it clearly. If they had, if he had, he says, Ted said, if I put Sammy Hagar and Van Halen, and again, it never even got close to that. Like, no, Sammy was never, never knew. It was never like, it was never even like that. It was just sort of like whispering and thinking. He said, I would have made the biggest mistake in rock history because he said Van Halen never would have made it in 1977 without Roth. He said they were just sort of that Eddie Van Halen, David Lee Roth, that whole kind of that Jagger Richards, whatever you want to say, the Townsend, um, Pete Townsend, Roger Daltrey thing with the with the people together in the band, the, the guitar player and the front man together. It was just that was there with those guys and it worked. And he just said that was what was the uh, the ultimate thing that's made Van Halen make it was those guys together. And he said, if you didn't, if I had started separating those two guys together, it never would have happened. And Ted's, you know, hundred percent was uh, committed to thinking that this Roth guy is, is the right guy for Van Halen and was essential to their success. And can't pass uh, a chance to say how much Michael Anthony's background vocals, especially on Van Halen one made the whole album sound better. I read an article today where Ted says his all time favorite Van Halen song by a mile is ain't talking about love. Yep. And in the same article, which I couldn't remember as an excerpt from your book or just uh, something that's, that that's a review of your book that he's still not sold on jump. He's still like, eh, I think yeah, that's I mean, just so interesting given how beautiful that song is and how popular it was. It seems to have been like something that that Ted Templeman would just absolutely love. And he he's really kind of nonplussed about it. Yeah, there's a lot of layers, a lot of stuff there. I mean, the making of the 1984 records, so we're jumping ahead to 1983, was extremely difficult. Um, you know, I'd let people read the book and kind of, kind of uh, take Ted's um, words and kind of sort through them and see see how that all kind of registers in their mind but it was a very difficult record to make and i think the other thing so there's that that exp the thing is that i think because the record was difficult and ted will admit this freely he's like you know it you know, the, the basically the process of making the record it may have made a beautiful thing and ted would be the first person to tell you that eddie van halen was dead right it's a it was a, a you know a game changer for van halen it was a, a brilliant piece of writing and for uh for eddie van halen to basically in lack of a better word like stand up and say to the to david lee roth and ted templeman and say i want to do this song we should do this song it's good and to convince those guys go okay let's give it a chance let's do it and um you know he gives them all the credit in the world but the thing i would say is that ted i think doesn't like it because for you know for whatever reason he really felt that the guitar playing of eddie van halen was something so special you know, I, I, I try to think of the right analogy in the times of the context of his other his other artists. I mean, think about someone like the voice of Michael McDonald. If Michael McDonald like decided to like sing in a totally different style or something like that, like I'm not going to sing with my Michael McDonald like signature mm -hmm. sound. I'm going to change it. Like, why, why would you do that? Like, this is something that everybody knows and loves. You know, I think to Ted, 
it goes back to identifiability. It's when you heard Eddie Van Halen play guitar, everyone knew it was Eddie Van Halen. Anyone who knew it was still today. I mean, you know, it's Hendrix and Clapton. There's like maybe five or seven, 10 guys in the world who you can really right away, if you listen, if you're a guitar player, you hear and you go, you know who that is. Go, oh, I know exactly who that is. Mm -hmm. And then there are other guys who are amazing, but aren't quite as identifiable. And Eddie was one of those guys. And I think for Ted, it came down to, it was taking the guitar out of the hands of a guy who is one of the world's best. And then also producing a song, meaning creating a song that Ted was, I, I, from the best I could tell, concerned, maybe would not be received well by people. It was going to be such a departure. Right. For, and from Ted's perspective, I think I think it's fair to say, you know, for only because of the musical the musical direction that the guys wanted to go in with something like the Doobie Brothers, Ted had already gone through it where there was a complete change of course in a lot of ways. It's not complete, but a very very sharp turn with again or with Little Feet. Little Feet sound changed because Lowell George wasn't around anymore. The Doobie Brothers sound changed because Tom Johnson. Right. had had departed the band and i think for ted he's like why would we change we have everything here and so you know when he says he doesn't like the song you know i, I always i can i guess for me that's ted's words and i would probably couch that in my own as the co-author just to say that that's ted's words and he should they should stand on their own but also i think that ted would tell you that once he heard the lyrics with ross lyrics and all the parts together he said this is this is great he just didn't think it was great for van halen you know and that's that was his perspective but as ted has said to me a number of times he goes i didn't say let's not do the song i didn't tell those guys i'm the producer i'm the vice president of warner brothers records this is the way it's going to be i get to pick the songs you guys want your you know want to continue on warner brothers right. we're not doing the song he 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 shepherd you know he helped mix the song he shepherded the song he, you know he worked with those guys to, to make the song so you know for ted ted you know ted's you know ted's take is on he he you know it's good enough for a van halen record obviously he, they put it on the van halen record and he liked it he just thought it was like not what they should he thought was their i don't want to say niche but what he thought showcased their talents better mm -hmm. you know he just, you know is I that think, why they put the is that why to something you mentioned a few seconds ago and then i have one more question i'll turn it over to mark for the minutes we have left but is that why they put the 1984 instrumental to try to like as soon as you start this album, you're going to realize it's completely different. You know, I, I, I you know, I, that's a really interesting question. You know, what's really, when people read about the making of 1984, I never actually even um, had talked to Ted about this, but this is a great question because there was a lot of stuff that went on at the end, the end game of making that record where um, Eddie and Don Landy, Ed's uh, engineer and Ted's, you know, Ed, basically uh, Ed's best friend, and along with Ted's engineer really worked on, let's just say finishing off the record that basically mm -hmm. there was a lot of sort of stuff that went on. And it's kind of in retrospect, kind of, it's kind of crazy. And uh, the way that, you know, meaning crazy was not a conventional end to the making of a record the way it was made. And so I'm not even sure who, whose decision that was. I presume that Ted, Ted sequenced all the records and Ted may have realized, okay, if they want to put this keyboard piece on there, it fits with that. But it also, I mean, kind of fits with what Eddie and Don wanted to do, which is they were really committed to this new with all weight, which Ted liked, you know, Ted, like, you know, you know, Ted's like, I don't love jump, but he can recognize it's a great song. I don't think he ever thought all weight was a great song. I think did, he just thought he, like, didn't he torture Eddie Van Halen by uh, humming, uh, um, hold your head up. Yeah, I mean, to him, he's he, you know, he just by he Argent, just, he just he talks about it. he's like we got this signature situation. We have this incredible guitar player with this incredible vocalist. We've got this this guy who can write this incredible rock riffs one after another. We have this mountain of stuff, this backlog of material. Why are we doing stuff that to him didn't to him showcase what he thought was the best of Van Halen? And obviously, I think the thing that you know Ted would probably tell tell us if he was sitting here, you know. He's like, he knows it, that Ed was changing, that Ed's musical, you know, he sort of realized that it was sort of like it was building. Ed was building towards something else. And, you know, it, it just became something that was undeniable to him musically. This is where he was going. He obviously was writing more and more keyboard stuff. It started with 1984 and it started before that, but it was sort of building towards more smooth pop songs and that was what you sort of saw with 1984 it was transitioning for that for 5150 and then you know more so with some of the other stuff he did with sammy and so you know um it was definitely i think a uh a 
part of why there was this fracturing around the relationship with with Ted. I, you know, I've never talked to Eddie Van Halen about this, and and Ted can't say that for sure. But definitely, I think I think the fact that Ted didn't get it, I think probably was something that really bothered um, Ed Van Halen. And from Ted's perspective, he's like, "Look, I was just trying to be honest. I was just trying to say I don't love this. If you want to do this, we can do it. I don't love it." And I think, you know, I think that was part of where the you know, for at least for this, that that initial first part, Ted would work with them later again in the in the early part of the '90s. But I think that was part of what was was happening. There were a lot of different parts of that equation with David Lee Roth and all this other stuff. But I think you know, I think that was definitely a part of it. Where you know that uh, Eddie Van Halen was getting to the point going, I don't need anybody to produce my music, which then actually you know ended up happening with him and Don Landy. It was really just you know for the most part Eddie producing with Don along with Don, but mostly Eddie making the musical decisions for the records that subsequently followed. Um, you know, beyond Mick Jones was there for the 5150, but the other albums was basically was Ed um, for, for uh, OU812. And that's why a uh, last question very quickly is, and that's, that's why you actually anticipated my last question, which is Ted had worked with Sammy Hagar in Montrose, had worked with him had produced VOA and, and mm -hmm. they had a good relationship by all accounts. Hagar joins Van Halen. He obviously had produced the previous six Van Halen records. And so what you're saying is, what I think I hear you saying is, Eddie Van Halen had a direction he wanted to go with Van Halen's music, and then he and Ted just didn't agree. So when Van Halen broke up in 85, Ted went with Roth, and Hagar joined Van Halen. It always seemed odd to me that, that Templeman wouldn't just stay with Van Halen, considering he knew Sammy Hagar so well, and quite frankly, he was a huge Sammy Hagar fan. Yeah, there's so there's a lot of stuff in the book about that, and uh, yeah, let me let me um, take that and kind of run with the ball on that one. The uh, thing I would say is that when Ted worked with Dave prior to Van Halen breaking up on a solo project, that was the E um, Crazy from the Heat EP, and you know Ted had thought the making of the 1984 record had taken a lot out of all the guys. There had been a lot of strife. And a lot of just a lot of problems in the making of that record, particularly between Dave and the other guys. And, and Ted had kind of gotten caught in the middle with all that stuff that Ted's thinking was, OK, we'll make this EP with Dave. Dave wanted to do it and we'll do all cover songs. And it'll be kind of a novelty thing that would give some breathing room for Van Halen to kind of regroup. Ted thought Ted thought, OK, look, they're going to come off the road. We don't, you know, Ted, I, Ted would tell you he didn't have any illusions. He didn't think he was going to be producing another Van Halen record necessarily because there had been, you know, there'd been, there'd definitely been um, some bruised egos and some problems there. Um, he, I mean, he was open-minded about it. He would do it, but I, he, you know, he just said, look, they just needed some breathing room. Whatever they decided to do, um, I figured let the thing, do the thing with Dave. That would give them into the spring of 85 before they had to really kind of crank up the Van Halen machine again. It would give those kinds of ties to kind of, you know, get things out of their system. And, uh, what ended up happening, of course, was that the, the EP does extremely well, which, again, from this is from my uh, my personal take on what I, I know. And then Ted kind of, you know, hinting at this that he's, you know, he didn't have like firsthand knowledge about this. But for what he kind of gathered from the kind of the grapevine back in the day was that the, the, the Van Halen brothers particularly were not super happy with this. They kind of felt that Dave had used the Van Halen name as a stepping stone to his own solo career and to Ted. You know, it's interesting, too. He talks about in the book how shocked he was, how great it did. He just said, he said to me, I love the, 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 what he said to me. He goes, you know, to me, in the spring of 1985, the idea of having Christopher, Christopher Cross, um, Carl Wilson, and David Lee Roth doing a Beach Boys song didn't seem like the recipe to a, number, a top five hit. He's like, I didn't see that coming. And it, it basically it became this huge thing. And Dave was on late night television. And that definitely... I want to say backfire, but it didn't, it didn't do any of the things that Ted had hoped. So when Van Halen splits some months later in the summer of 85, Ted didn't want them to break up. Uh, Ted talks in the book, how he was basically calling like, what, like, what are you, you know, what are you guys doing? Just well, come on. This is like, this is a once in a lifetime band here. You're not going to be able to just, you know, kind of, um, you know, throw this all the way without regrets. And he, he's, but, you know, that things kind of got um, locked in, but then Sammy Hagar showed up. And on, again, on paper, I think your, your point's well taken, Robert, is that, well, this, all well, this just makes perfect sense. Don Landy had worked with uh, 
Sammy Hagar back in Montrose. Ted Templeman had worked with Sammy Hagar in Montrose. The guys in Van Halen knew Sammy from festivals they had met before. And um, Ted had, you know, um, obviously it had a long running relationship. He just produced his, the VOA record with, with uh, Sammy. So what ends up happening though, is that Ted is totally against this because he's like, no, get, get, we, Dave has got to be in the band. And it wasn't Ted's call. But Ted, you know, basically is said to me in so many words, he said, I, you know, I may not have been able to stop, but I didn't have to necessarily facilitate it. You know, I, I really felt strongly that you cannot just plug another guy into Van Halen and make it Van Halen. So, you know, the example that I have always used, and um, there's a number of them, like, you know, like, to, it might sound like a ludicrous analogy to some people, but to Ted, it was almost like Lennon and McCartney. You know, they got the two guys together. You can't just plug someone else into the Beatles and go, yeah, Paul McCartney's left. We'll just get somebody else in there who's a great singer and it'll be fine. The Ted's like, well, no, it's not the Beatles anymore. It's, it's those guys. And so he was, he was against it. And, and at the end of the day, when after Warner Brothers told Eddie Van Halen that uh, we're not going to let you produce it alone, we're not, you know, we don't think, we don't want the band to produce the record. You got to get someone to do it. They, they, they went to Ted even though Ted had already kind of been, you know, kind of um, expressed his negativity about the idea. They went to him, Sammy did, and basically said, hey, Ted, come on, come on, Ted, it's me, Sammy, produce the record. And Ted said no. And uh, that caused a lot of a lot of problems. And, you know, the thing for Ted was that it was a very emotionally charged thing for him, because as you mentioned, he loved Sammy. I mean, he and Sammy had had a long relationship. He had just produced a record with Sammy. He, in fact, he had plans to produce another record with Sammy. Um, this, uh, the follow-up to VOA was supposed to start in September. They were supposed to do in September of 85. They were supposed to do another, another record together. So, you know, for all of that, for Ted's, you know, signed Van Halen, felt very much, um, you know, uh, a very, very uh, proud relationship with Ed that he was basically like, you know, that, that Ed had gone from being somebody who was an unknown to working with Ted in these albums with the rest of the band to becoming, a, you know, the greatest guitarist in the world. Ted had a great affection for Ed Van Halen and the guys. And so it was a very... Uh, you know, it was a very unfortunate thing how it all turned out. And then the, and the, at the end, you know, sort of the musical chairs thing was like t- Ted and Dave, like, okay, you know, we're together. And they had had a long, Ted had produced every single thing that Dave had ever done in a, in a studio as a professional musician. And so it was kind of a, an obvious thing. So Ted did the Eat of and Smile band, but yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's really kind of a remarkable thing to think about the fact that Ted loved Sammy as a singer, thought he was super talented, but didn't want to produce an album with Sammy singing as Van Halen. And uh, Teppelman produced Eat Him and Smile, which is a terrific, terrific musical album with Billy Sheehan and Greg Bissonette, Bissonette and of course, uh, Steve Vai. And then I read that he was supposed to produce Roth's second album and passed over what became, I think, Permanent Vacation by Aerosmith to produce produce Roth's second album. And then Roth, Roth punked him out and ended up producing it himself. And I think Templeman said easily cost him a million dollars. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I, I, I would, I would suspect maybe more. I mean, think about it long-term. I mean, I, you know, obviously there's no guarantee that um, the Aerosmith record that Ted had done with Aerosmith prior had not done all that well. It done okay. It done all that well. So there's no, you know, we should give full credit to Bruce Fairbairn, which Ted does in the book that Bruce did an amazing job producing permanent vacation. And, you know, they delivered a monster. It was a monster hit. But um, yes, Ted did basically, he was in line to produce their second Aerosmith record in a row. Those guys wanted to work with Ted and Ted went to David Lee Roth and said, you're going to do, you, when are you doing to do your record? And it turned out the two records clashed in time. And Ted's like, I can't, there's no way I can do two, two records, these two records at the same time. I got to give each of them my full attention. So he went to the Aerosmith guys and said, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I really wanted to do this because I want to, I want to give another chance to do a better record with you guys. But I've been working with Dave since 1977. I'm going to pass on Aerosmith. I'm sorry. And they said, okay. They found another producer. And then, but one time he went back to Roth and said, when do we start? You know, he'd already, they'd already given up, you know, let the rope go on Aerosmith. And uh, Roth said, oh yeah, I'm going to produce it myself. And and in so many words, fired Ted. Yeah. Fired Ted after um, seven platinum, eight eight platinum records in a row. And to square the circle. And then uh, Mark, I want you to end the podcast with the next few minutes and ask some more questions, but uh, Bruce Fairbain, who produced uh, Permanent Vacation, I believe, ended up producing Van Halen's Balance. I think, if that's correct, mm-hmm. came back and produced a Van Halen record. Mark, we have we have you have indulged me with my Van Halen uh, love, so go right ahead. 
Well, Robert, I can't believe that he brought up Christopher Cross and <laughs> didn't say anything about the Newmanium. So <laughs> that's, that's something. Uh, now, the last, the last question, Greg. I think it, 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 talking about squaring the circle. What's the through line in Ted Templeman's work? Is there a through line besides Ted himself? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the through line for Ted is Ted, what drove Ted was just an absolute love of the creative process of making music. He had been making it since he was a little kid. And that's where I think going through his whole career, he was a musician. I mean, he remains a musician. That's what he is at his heart and soul. And he loved collaborating with musicians. I think the other, so that, that sort of stretches through his whole career. The other, you know, the through line I think for Ted was that what drove him was and he didn't get to do that, that as much later in his career because he had kind of gotten to a position in the company where he was expected to and needed to just to sort of do his, his corporate duty was to take on bigger acts that were established and that's what he loved was kind of taking somebody out of nowhere and turning them into a star and that wasn't about his personal ego trip he just thought i really like seeing somebody who has worked anyone who's worked hard enough to get a record deal on a major label who has talent, we've all recognized that the companies that talent, we want people to appreciate the talent. So Doobie Brothers, Van Halen, the third person we didn't talk about, the third act was Nicolette Larson. I mean, that was one of the great, the things Ted felt so emotional about was that Nicolette was this girl from Kansas City, basically, who had been a background singer, had sung on some Neil Young records, some Commander Cody records. And she was, you know, she was one of these girls who was, um, was a go-to girl for studio work and had gone on the road and stuff like that. And never, she never had any dream, you know, dreams of being like a star, like, you know, like a Linda Ronstadt or a, a Dolly Parton or one of these people. But Ted um, met her through Linda Ronstadt, decided to sign her to Warner brothers. And she, you know, she went through and, and became a, you know, had a top 10 hit and became a big star herself for, you know, for kind of a good moment in the sun there with a couple of albums that did well. And Ted said, one of the things that was, he was most proud of is that, she had this scrapbook that she kept and uh, she had all the stuff of her life and it was kind of, then it got it to the stuff she was showing him. And then at the end of the book, it was where she was in her career. She just had a gold record and a new record coming out. And she said, and it was like, you know, holding her, holding her gold record. And she's like, I owe it all to this guy. And she had a picture of Ted in there. And he said like, you know, made him like tear up and just that, you know, for him, that was the, the big, the thing, even like he worked with bullet boys and a couple of other um, crown Royal, uh, Royal crown review, which was the jazz guys. I mean, he really loved taking the people, the, a band that was just hungry and wanted to make it and really trying to get them in, in the spotlight, be the lighting man and say, look, these guys are talented. This group, this woman, this man, these people are talented. You should check these people out. And I think that was the through line all the way to the very end, which is Crown Royal, Royal Crown Review, excuse me. Royal Crown Review is one of the last things that Ted did as um, one of those neo swing groups um, out of LA, great band that t Ted loved, loved doing that. He wanted to get those, those um, previously unknown people in the spotlight. I'm good. Robert, are you going to do a break now? No, I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to let uh, Dr. Renoff go. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Ain't Talking About Love, the song on Van Halen 1, was Ted Templeman's favorite song. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's his favorite song, not Van Halen's song. I think you said it's his favorite song. But one of the songs he produced is one of the catchiest songs of all time which won who knows how many awards and so and sold it who knows how many records and albums and that is the doobie brothers hit what a fool believes yeah does he talk about that in your book or what does he think about that song it's so unbelievably brilliant it's the perfect mesh of of that sort of instrumentation and michael mcdonald's voice we talked about that quite a bit you know um when you have hits, they definitely become the things I think, at least in Ted's mind, I mean, I think probably most producers, they kind of stick out in your mind. I mean, obviously, you know, I would listen to album tracks with Ted and he might not, I don't, I don't you know, kind of had to refresh his memory, like a, you know, like a third song on the second side of, of a Doobie Brothers record he may not have heard in, in a, two decades or a decade. But um, yeah, the, because, you know, one of the things interesting about What a Fool Believes was that it was a song that both really Ted and Michael McDonald kind of had gotten 
to lose confidence about. That Michael McDonald come up with a song idea. He didn't think it was great. And then when they started working on it, they couldn't quite get the song right. So there's a whole long chapter about this process that went on. It, it just couldn't quite get the, get the song right. And uh, at the end of the process, what ended up happening was that Ted was, was just almost despondent that he could not articulate to the guys in the Doobie Brothers the tempo he wanted and how he wanted the song to feel. He just felt like it was just this, he said it, it kind of wandered. He said it just, it really puzzled me to how to kind of get the feel of the song, you know, the feel of the song right. And uh, Don Landy, his engineer, suggested when they were doing it, and they had been trying to tra record the song for days and days and days, and they were kind of running up against the deadline. He goes, just go, go play it. And Ted was a drummer. And Ted's like, oh, no, no, I'm not going to play it. He goes, go, go play it. Like, John was like, go play it. Go show them what you want. Like, go play it. See if we can get it. And that's the, actually the take that's on the record is Ted Templeman playing um, drums with the other, Do the Doobie Brothers drummer. Um, but the, yeah, the song itself is, you know, was magical for the Doobie Brothers. And it's one of those, those absolutely uh, signature Michael McDonald songs. And of course, for Ted Templeman too, that was his song that, uh, and that album is what he won his Grammy Awards for. And so that was, uh, you know, to go from, thinking honestly like he talked about and again he's you know ted um, occasionally uses words that you have to understand in the context of what he means and he said like i would think it's a piece of junk he didn't mean like it was actually like a terrible song but he meant like <laughs> it's not it's not right it wasn't right it wasn't ready to be on a record because he didn't have it right he goes from being thinking basically going we got to keep this we got to put this in the can and or see what we can do to try to fix this to becoming a number one hit and then the the, the launch of a, a huge Grammy winning night, incredible night for the Duke brothers in February, 1980 was a, was a big thing. And that was, yeah, that was what a fool believes. It's amazing that he's doing that song. What a fool believes. And right around the same time, he's producing songs like uh, Jamie's crying and, and so many other iconic hits. Uh, one last question. Were there other producers? Are there other producers whom Ted mentioned as people he admired or really were masters at their craft, you know, Phil Spector, George Martin, Quincy Jones, where he's like, you know, these guys are really, really good. Did he have peers whom, whom he admired? Yeah. I mean, I think for sure um, George Martin would be up there. I, you know, he was like so many people, an absolute Beatles fanatic and absolutely loved those records. I mean, the thing interesting, I'll tell you a quick anecdote about George Martin is that Ted, Ted would play me um, things like all your loving and go, listen. And I'm like, what? He's like, you didn't hear it. I go, what? He goes, McCartney missed a bass note there. And he would like run it back. And I kind of could kind of hear it. Like when he played it and he goes, you see that? He goes, George Martin, he knew. He's like, you know, mistakes. It doesn't matter. Sometimes you just got to get the performance on tape. So George Martin, um, the other one, I mean, really, he gives enormous credit to, and there are a lot of people I can mention, but I think, I think Ted would want me to mention Lenny Warrenker. Lenny Warrenker was, um, was Ted's mentor and and Lenny too was a guy who had had just hits with such a, a variety of, of, of artists. I mean, one person in particular, an album I really love that Lenny did. And there's so many I can mention is Ricky Lee Jones, such a great, a great record came out 78, 79, right around that same time that uh, Ted was doing Doobie brothers. And, you know, Ted said that he was kind of my, my touchstone for production. He just really, you know, when Ted had a problem with the record, he'd go sit down with Lenny or he was struggling to think about how to do something. Even again, when he was like, you know, making hits, he would still like look to Lenny as his, his sounding board. And then they did, um, they did uh, behind the sun with Eric Clapton, which was a huge, a huge hit for, for Clapton as well. And, uh, Oh, I got to give you one more anecdote. So next time you listen to forever, man, and you hear those, uh, uh, those drums in the background, um, Timbales, that's Ted Templeman playing Timbales on forever, man. Well, that's a perfect way to end the podcast with this, Greg Renoff is the author of uh, Ted Templeman, a platinum producer's life in music. It's available on Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Goodreads. Uh, if you are a fan of seventies and eighties music, especially please pick up the book, support Greg and his efforts. There's so many wonderful stories about so many terrific songs and amazing, memorable albums. Uh, Greg had come on before to talk about just his Van Halen book, uh, which we've promoted and we want you to buy that as well. It's called a uh, Van Halen rising, how a Southern California backyard party band saved heavy metal. And it's very kind of Greg to come on again. Uh, we were of course joined by our sponge worthy co-host, Mark Allen. Mark, do you have a final Seinfeld quote 
or or do you want to express just very quickly your feelings about the passing of uh, Frank Costanza, uh, Jerry Stiller? Well, obviously a great loss, but you know what I, I wanted to do on this podcast that I didn't get to do was when you were going into a break, I wanted to say, one break coming up. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to say, uh, uh, come on, Mark, give me a break. Go ahead, Greg, say it. <laughs> I would Thank do better you. than David Lee Roth laughed, I think, probably at this point in time. But yeah, like, yeah, come on, come on, Mark, give me a break. Come on, Mark. One break coming up. There you go. Thank you very well, much. And I, have- I wanted to give a I wanted to give a quick shout out to Mark's website because I hope he was going to shout out his own website, the tape archives, right? Is a uh, is quite a resource. Yeah. Amazing Go ahead, Mark. stuff. Talk Please. about it. Yeah. Um my my website, the tapes archive.com, is a uh, it's a collection of interviews that I did in the 80s and 90s and a little bit of 2000s with uh, a variety of artists. Alex Van Halen is on there from 1980 or 81, and he talks about Ted Templeman, and it's uh, it's really nice. I mean, he, he considered Ted Templeman the fifth member of the group. Um, the uh, the most recent uh, uh, interview on there is Keith Emerson, but this will air in June. I don't know what's coming up. I think we've got uh, Tracy Morgan, uh, Peter Buck from REM, Colin Moulding from XTC. So, Amazing. Um, yeah, I've listened to an, uh, a, a number of the interviews and the transcriptions. It's an absolutely amazing. It's to so a music historian or anyone who loves thinking about what it was like back in the day when there used to be long form interviews in magazines. But it's kind of a lost art with everyone like clicking on these things for two seconds on the internet, where you could actually have somebody have a long conversation. It's really a remarkable resource. And I really would urge everyone to check it out. The tapes archive. It's. Thanks. It is honestly incredible. I was like, when I heard, I was like, really? There's like, like a whole bunch of these tapes. It was like, whole, oh, you know, Neil Pert, and there was like all. I just the first one I think was Neil Pert, and I was just been, yeah. yeah. I cannot recommend the website enough and support this man and his efforts. Thanks. That's very very kind, and uh, both of you stayed way late, and the discussion could go on for sure. I have lots more questions. I'm sure Mark does as well. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, let's we'll stay in touch via email we'll figure out a way to maybe have another zoom conversation that's not necessarily part of a podcast i would enjoy that. happy to do it and yeah i was really enjoyed the conversation you guys come with great questions and it was a great pleasure thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about the book and uh yeah please uh in this in this unusual world we live in i uh yes i'm very glad it's out there and if uh, people have that opportunity to pick up the book or check it out please do You have been listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana. Perfect sponsor for a Van Halen podcast, of course, and this other uh, Captain Beefheart fellow you mentioned, Garmon Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest has been professor, doctor, professor, author, uh, chronicler, historian, Greg Renoff, author. Thank you so much for your time. Mark Allen, thank you very much for co-hosting. You brought a lot to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks thank for you, having me. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Robert at veteranstrategies.com.